Today we're carrying on with our series, One Another, and we're relearning how to live together through this series. What does the Word of God have to say about community, relationships in this world that we're faced with today. Pastor Ash did an incredible job last week. If you haven't seen the message, go watch it on our YouTube, uh, see on our YouTube platform. And it was a message called Heart to Heart. And it spoke to the idea that relationships, community begin at the heart level. And he spoke into the fact that we have to have a heart for one another, but it begins with this idea that who is on the throne of our hearts. And it was an incredible message. And today, really, I just want to bounce off of a lot of what he said. But before we get into anything, I want to say, let's pray. God, we want to thank you that as we come together, as we gather together from different homes, different contexts, different, different continents even, God, we want to pray that, that today we would hear your voice, that we would align behind your word. And as I, as I decrease, God, would you increase? Father, would the words of my mouth, meditations, would the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight? God, I pray that there would be transformation in every relationships. Would the good ones get better? Would the broken ones be healed? Would the distant ones become closer? Father, I pray that the hearts of parents would be drawn to the hearts of the children. I pray that spouses would become closer today. And I pray that our words to one another would be filled with encouragement and hope and grace because of what gets spoken today. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. And I pray that everyone in every home would shout amen and type it in every comment section. The title for today's message is Calling Out John's. And it might not make sense right now, but I want to encourage you, stay tuned, stay plugged in, sit on the edge of your seat as you would for every single sports match that's happening this weekend. And I know this weekend is packed with sports, but I want to encourage you, what's going to happen in the next 30 to 40 minutes is going to be more important than any sports match is going to be this weekend. So today I want to speak to you about what Jesus told us. Jesus said to us when he was here on earth that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we know this, right? We know that relationships begin at the heart level. But for some reason, the way we're designed is that from the heart, what happens is it overflows and it comes out of our mouth and, and our tongues do things. Right, what happens in relationships is it progresses from our heart and it doesn't go through our hands, it doesn't come through our actions next. What happens is it comes through our heart and the very next thing that happens is we speak words. Our tongues are connected to our hearts in a way that nothing else is. It's like there's a direct link from our tongues to our hearts. Biologists haven't discovered how it works yet, but the word of God has. Right? Nowhere else has it been discovered, but the Word of God, Jesus has told us that there's a direct link between our hearts and our tongues. And we know this to be true. We know that, that there's, a, there's a link and, and we can identify with, with our people, you know, our tribes, with our accents, our words, our phraseology. I can tell who you connect with by how you speak. You know, in South Africa, we don't call traffic lights traffic lights. We call them robots, right? And the moment I say, I'm gonna, you go to the second robot and turn left, you can immediately tell where I'm from. I'm from South Africa, right? There's certain phrases that we use in different parts of the world that immediately locate us to a specific geography and to a specific people. And I bet this is true for you and your family as well. I bet when someone comes into your family, you say certain things, you use certain phrases that when people come into your family, they need a translator to help them understand what you're saying. Right. That's true for my family. My father and I can say certain things. We can have whole conversations that even the other people in my family don't understand. But why? It's because when you have a relationship with someone, when you've got shared experiences, when you've watched the same movies, read the same books, gone to the same places, shared experiences, what do you have? You have a shared vocabulary. And when your hearts are connected, in a way, your tongues are connected because you speak the same language. And out of that vocabulary, your relationship deepens, your intimacy goes to a new level. And so in relationships, words matter. 
Words matter in a way that goes beyond just vocabulary. Words matter in a way that goes beyond just the study of words. And during the season, two things have happened to attack this area in our relationships. Number one, part of what has made this season so difficult, this COVID lockdown, isolation season, what has made this so difficult is prolonged times of silence. For some of us, we know this to be true. We've, we've had to go into lockdown. We've had to be distant from the people we love the most for a long time. And, and instead of the words that deepen relationships, we've had to undergo seasons of silence and separation. And instead of words that deepen intimacy, we've had to undergo silence that deepens suspicion. And what happens is when we're in silence, instead of reflecting on words that speak love into our inner dialogue, all we've got is our inner dialogue. And when all you're listening to is your own thoughts and your own reflections on that inner silence, we know this to be true. What happens? In that inner silence creep thoughts of fear, creep thoughts of anxiety, creep thoughts of doubt and suspicion. And instead of intimacy developing, distance develops. And so what happens in the midst of that silence? Distance. And even though the love of the other person hasn't grown cold, we feel like the distance has grown. And so in the absence of communication, in the absence of words, distance develops. The second thing that's happened during the season is actually the other extreme. So if on the one side we've got silence, on the, other, on the other extreme we've got this tension that develops when we're in such close proximity with one another that our words are used as weapons instead of bricks to build up one another. So instead of silence, we're in this constant barrage of words that tear us down instead of build us up. And instead of the people closest to us using words to show love, those words come out of a place of frustration and they tear us down. It may have been your boss, it may have been a parent, it may have been a spouse, whoever it was, but those words come out of a place of brokenness in them and they break us down. Yeah. Or it may have been you, you know you've used words to break others down. Yeah. And so we've got these two extremes at this time. We've got words, we've got a place of absolute silence where the lack of words create distance or we've got this other extreme where words of abuse create brokenness. And I want to say right off the bat, we were not created to experience either of these extremes. We were not created to be creatures of where relationships experience either of these two extremes. We were created. We were created by our creator to have and give life-giving communication. Life-giving communication is, suppo is supposed to flow from us and into us. There's supposed to be this flow, right? There's supposed to be this constant in and out of life-giving, life-building communication. Words are supposed to flow from us and into us that encourage and build us up. That's what we're supposed to experience. In fact, when God creates mankind, you can read this in Genesis, when God creates man, what is the first thing we experience as a species? It says, and God created them and he blessed and spoke to them. The first thing we experience in terms of a species is blessing and relationship with our heavenly father through words. The first thing we experience as a species is blessing and relationship through communication, through life-giving words. And then you fast forward to, to when our, our, our sin is created, absolute brokenness, when our separation from our Father is at its worst, and God needs to step in and repair that relationship. What does John tell us? It's the word that comes in and repairs a relationship that it was beyond our ability to repair. So at the beginning, 
Our relationship with God was started by a word, and then when we needed the absolute help from God to repair that relationship, it was the word that came and repaired a relationship. In relational context, in relational areas, words matter. And it is the word made flesh that came and established the most important relationship you and I will ever have. Words matter. We were created to have and receive life-giving, encouraging communication. We were made to be the givers of words that make others want to step into all that God has for them. And we were made to receive those same kind of words. And please hear me, I'm not saying for a moment that I get this right all the time. I I know that I'm speaking this morning as someone who is trying to get this right. But I wanna read to you a passage that brings all this together. Before I read it to you, I wanna give you a bit of context. There's a man called Zechariah, and he's a priest, and and he goes into the Holy of Holies. Uh, It's his turn to, to, to go into the presence of God. And as he goes into the presence of God, he meets an angel. And the angel says to him, Zechariah, you and your wife are going to have a son. I've heard your prayers. God has heard your prayers. And you're going to have a son. It's incredible. He speaks about what the son is going to do, the the, the prophetic purpose that's going to be upon the son. He says the son's going to be called John. He gives him a name that's tied to the purpose. And Zechariah, in the presence of an angelic visitation where a prophetic word is being spoken to him, He reacts to this word with doubt. Zechariah responds to an angelic angelic voice. He responds to a prophetic answer to one of the prayers that he's prayed, and he responds with doubt. And he leaves that presence unable to speak. We read that Zechariah leaves that presence, and he can't speak. His voice has been taken from him, and he isn't allowed to speak because he couldn't respond to the voice of God with faith. But then I want to get to you. I want to get to Luke chapter 1 verse 57. We now go 9 months into the future from that initial visitation. Luke chapter 1 verse 57. It says now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her. And they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they would have called him Zechariah after his father. But his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he answered, and and he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And they all wondered. And immediately his mouth was opened, his tongue was loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, what then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. So nine months have passed, right, between the angelic visitation, the birth of John. And for nine months, Zechariah has said nothing. He has not spoken a single word. The consequence of his misalignment to God's word in the temple was to be silent in his own home. He was silent for nine months while his wife was carrying a miracle. His wife was carrying a miracle baby and he could not say a single word. He was a priest His job was to speak atonement and blessing over an entire nation. And he couldn't even speak a blessing over his own wife and unborn child. He was robbed of the ability to speak. He was stuck in silence after he couldn't align with the words of God. His voice couldn't be heard after he couldn't get behind the voice he had heard from God. I wonder if the point here is that if we can't align ourselves with God's prophetic voice over other people in our lives, if we should just be quiet. 
I wonder if God is trying to say to us through the pages of this story, I wonder if God is saying, it's better for you to keep quiet than say something that's not in line with what I wanna say over other people in your world. Because God, here's the reality, God has a prophetic purpose for every single person in this world. God has a prophetic destiny for every single man, woman, and child that you will ever come into contact with. God has not run out of plans. He's not run out of destinies for the people in your world. And the reality is if we're gonna come into conflict with that plan that God has for someone else, it's better for us to keep quiet than to say something that's out of line with what God wants to say over that person. If we wanna speak, if we wanna build great relationships, you know what's best for us to do? To say what God wants to say over the people in our world. And I wonder if the point here, if the reason that Zechariah was quiet for nine months is because he couldn't align himself with what God wanted to say. If God has plans for people in our lives, we might as well keep quiet if we can't get behind those plans. So this household lives in a place of silence for nine months. We can assume they pass notes because you know Elizabeth knew the baby's name was John. But for nine months, Elizabeth doesn't hear the words, I love you, from her husband. Think about it. For those of you who've been pregnant, who are pregnant, imagine your husband never being able to tell you, babe, I love you. How are you doing? Can I rub your feet? Can I rub your shoulders? Would you like some frozen vegetables? Maybe that was just my wife. That was what she craved when she was pregnant. Right, but what, whatever, what? Like, imagine as a as a pregnant woman, never hearing the voice of your husband the whole way through your pregnancy. Zechariah could not say he was there, but he couldn't say a single thing. We know that during her pregnancy, Elizabeth has a visit from Mary, and and during that time, there was a bit of noise in the home, and during that time, there was this incredible moment where the, the fetus within Elizabeth reacts to the fetus within Mary, and, and there's this extreme kids praise party that happens. You know, the, the two kids break out into a praise party, and there's this praise party within the house of Elizabeth. But now the time of the birth has come. A baby boy enters the world. It's a miracle. Everyone rejoices at this incredible miracle baby. But notice at the birth, there's still no words from Zechariah. He could say nothing to his wife or this newborn son on the day when a promised miracle becomes a reality. The day the baby is born, Zechariah was still silent. Nothing but breath passes the lips of the priest. On the day the baby was born, I don't know about you, but on both the days my children were born, man, so many things came out of my mouth. Praise, exhilaration, unbelief, so much stuff came out of my mouth. I wonder what it would be like if you weren't able to say a single thing on such an incredible day. But I also wonder if the point here is that if you operate from a place of disbelief, you're gonna be robbed on the day when that disbelief turns into a reality. If you doubt a person when they're nothing, you're not gonna be there when nothing turns into a reality. You know, if you, if you can't see a person's potential, don't be surprised when you aren't there the day they step into that potential. If all you can do is complain, don't be surprised when you aren't there the day that, 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 that it turns into celebration. I wanna encourage you, your words today are gonna to shape what you see tomorrow. If all you do is doubt and disbelieve and complain, don't be surprised if you miss the celebration and the potential of tomorrow. But if you can speak hope, if you can speak potential in today, you're gonna be there for the reward tomorrow. You're gonna see what God can do with your tomorrow. Eight days go by. Nothing but breath passes the lips of the priest. And on the eighth day, When the baby boy is going to be circumcised and named, everyone comes together again. And in the absence of the voice of the father, they just assume they're gonna call him by his father's name. Even though the context of this entire thing is miraculous and something unprecedented is happening, everyone just assumes that they will name this baby boy the same way they have named every other baby. 
They're going about the process the same way they have gone about naming every other child that has ever been born. They think they can name this new thing the same way they have named every other thing. But this is a new thing God is doing. John is a new thing that God is doing in the world, but the community sees a new thing through the lens of the old way. See, it's not the community's fault. It's not their fault. They were just doing what they had always done. They were operating according to what they knew. They were operating from their experience. They were naming a new thing according to their old pattern of thinking. Their words were coming out of their past pattern. And sometimes that's what will happen in our relationships. Sometimes people will come to us unaware that God is doing a new thing in our lives and they will still talk to us and relate to us based on past patterns of our behavior. They will still relate to us based on past experiences that they've had with us, even though God is doing a new thing in our world. And sometimes we'll do the same thing as well. We'll relate to people based on our experience of them, even though God is doing a new thing in their life. And so this is what's happening in the story. A community is coming to a new baby that God has placed a new mantle on, but they're expecting the same old to come out of a new thing. They're, they're speaking an old wineskin onto new wine. That's what's happening in the story. The problem, the problem here is that a John was being birthed, not a Zechariah. What the world needed was a prophet, not another priest. The problem is that a community just saw another priest where the kingdom of God saw a prophet, a herald that would usher in the Messiah. Are we looking into our world through the lenses of what has been or what can be? Are we looking at the people around us? Are we looking at our brothers and sisters, wives, husbands, sons, daughters? Are we looking at what they can be or what they have always been? Are we speaking over them words of prophetic potential or words of past experience? How are we speaking over people? Again, however, the community responds. You know, Elizabeth speaks up and she says, no, his name will be John. But the community says, no one in your family has been called John. There's no one in your family called John. They try and associate this baby to the people around him. They, they try and lock him into what has always been. You're a family of priests. He, he comes from a line of priests. He, he should continue what's always been. You may have heard this. Your family's always done it this way. This is what's always been. Don't, don't try to change things up. Don't try to do anything new. Just do what's always been done. Don't be a John. That's a Zechariah thing. Don't be a prophet. Be a priest. This is what your father did. This is what you need to do. And here's the reality. Words can lock us into legacies or words can launch us into destinies. I want to say that again. Words can lock us into legacies or words can launch us into destinies. Mary puts her foot, uh, Mary, Elizabeth puts her foot down. Said, no, his name is John. And they go, no, but it, there's no one in his family named John. And they motion to Zechariah and they go, well, what do you want? You're a priest. I'm sure you want your son to follow in your footsteps. I'm sure you want him to follow in the same track you followed in. I'm sure you want the same old, same old. And he gets a pen and a tablet. And in that moment, Zechariah has an opportunity. He's had nine months of silence to reflect on a moment when he could have aligned to the Word of God, but he chose not to. And in that moment, he writes, his name is John. In that moment, he declares over his son, he will not be another priest. He will step into the office of prophets. He will not be another me. He will be his own person. We do not need more priests. We need a prophet in this land. We do not need another me. We need another, we need a new John. We need a new thing. And as soon as he wrote that down and showed it to the community, his mouth was opened because in that moment, his mouth and his heart aligned with the mouth and heart of God. There was an alignment between what, what Zechariah said and what God had always said over this baby boy. 
Zechariah the priest called out John the prophet. A father called out of his son what no one else could see or hear because Zechariah had seen and heard what God said about John. I want to encourage us this morning. Why, why have I gone through this whole thing? It's because John was never meant to be shackled by past experiences or past expectations. John was called to be a prophet in the wilderness eating locusts and honey. He was being called to be a prophet calling a nation to repentance. He was gonna be the one to baptize the Messiah and usher in the ministry of Jesus. No one else in the history of the world was called to that. And so you can't be called to something new by being named by the past. But it took a father and a mother who aligned themselves to the Word of God to say, I'm gonna name and call something out of my son. I wonder, church, if there are people in our world that are waiting for us to call something out of them so they can step into the destiny that God has for them. I wonder if there are relationships that are dying in our world because we've only spoken the old over them instead of calling out the prophetic destiny in them. When everyone else wanted to declare the old, Elizabeth and Zachariah spoke what was new, even though it was unclear. And because they did, we have John the Baptist. We have a breakout of the prophetic that ushered in the ministry of the Messiah that led to the salvation of the world. The community wanted another priest named Zechariah, but God was calling a prophet named John. And God was doing it through the mouths of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Think about that. God, the sovereign God, the creator of the universe chose to call John through the mouths of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Whose calling is trapped in your mouth? Whose calling today, church? Whose prophetic potential, whose prophetic destiny is trapped in your mouth? And that's the reason I wanted to have a look at this this morning is simply this. What are our words calling out of the people in our world? In the relationships you have right now, never mind new people you're gonna meet. Never mind the new people in your future. The people you're in relationship with right now, right today. The people you're watching this with right now. What can you call out of those people? What prophetic potential can you call out of those people? What words can you speak? Instead of just calling them priests like you have been for years, what prophet can you call out of those people? Now, I'm not saying that every person in your world is supposed to be a prophet that lives in the wilderness and eats locusts and honey. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that I believe God has a prophetic potential attached to every single human being on this planet. And that if we could align ourselves to the heartbeat of God for every other person, we would begin to fill our words with that prophetic potential and we would begin to call out of every human being what God sees in every human being. And our words would be filled with encouragement, exhortation. In the New Testament, we read these words, 1 Thessalonians 5.11, encourage one another. Hebrews 3.13, exhort one another. And then this one I love, Hebrews 10.24, stir up one another to love and good works. Do your words stir up one another. Are our words stirring words? Do they stir up the prophetic potential in the people next to you? Or do they just do the same old, same old? Are we locking people into the same legacy, the same old? Are we just getting more and more priests? Or are we unlocking a generation of prophets that are gonna stir up a move of the prophetic that's gonna bring a change in this world? What are our words doing, church? A stirring up kind of word is not a word that's past focused. It's a word that ties a person to their prophetic potential. Practically, what does this look like? Very quickly, we need to see beyond a track record and a present set of circumstances. Our default needs to be celebration instead of complaining. 
Our default needs to be encouragement instead of discouragement. Our default needs to be to look what could be instead of look at what is, instead of looking at what was. In your communication, family, in your communication, and this is true for every relationship. I'm not putting boundaries on this. When you greet a waiter, next time you're allowed to go to a restaurant, can you call out the prophetic potential of that waiter? Next time you greet a leader, a boss, someone in church, a pastor, someone in government, can you call out the prophetic potential of that leader, your spouse, your children, whatever the relationship is, can your words, the words that are connected to your heart that come out of your mouth, can they call out the prophetic potential of that person? Can they call out the John? What are our words calling out, church? What are our words calling out? Because if we are going to do life with one another, I would rather do life with a whole bunch of people that are released into their prophetic potential as opposed to a people that are frustrated because they've been locked into past experiences. You and I were made, we were created. It's in our DNA to give and receive life-giving communication. It's what we were birthed into a creation. It's what God used to save us through the Word made flesh. And, this is, and if no one has ever said this to you, let me be the one this morning. There is a prophetic potential on you. There is something that God has for you and I wanna release it over you this morning. I wanna release it over you today. Be released into what God has for you. Stop being restricted by your past experiences. Stop being restricted by labels and what people have called you. Be released. Be released. And I wanna encourage you today, be the one that speaks those same words over others. Be the one that calls Johns out of the people around you. Be it parents, be it children, coworkers, whatever it is. Call the Johns out. Call the Johns out. I just wanna let Jesse sing over us. I just wanna let him minister to us in song for a moment. It's just one word, oh, with just one word, everything changes. I'm captivated, I'll never be the same. With just one word, everything changes. I'm captivated, I'll never be the same with just one word. Everything changes, I'm captivated, I'll never be the same with just one word. Everything changes, I'm captivated, I'll never be the same. Today, perhaps the first words you need to align yourself with are the words Jesus says about himself and the words Jesus says about you. You see, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And perhaps before we look at anyone else in our world, perhaps for you today, the biggest step you can do is say, Jesus, I align myself with what you say about you. And today, if you need to make the decision to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you need to say, Jesus, I believe what you say about you, I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe that you died and then three days later you rose again. And because of that fact, you deserve all my praise, all my adoration, everything. You deserve my heart. If today you've come to the point where you wanna give your life to Jesus, then I would love the honor and privilege to pray with you and to pray for you. And in a moment, I'm gonna pray a prayer. But there's gonna be a raise hand banner on our online platform. 
And there's going to be links on YouTube and Facebook. And I would love it. I would absolutely love it if you would hit those links because we would love to journey with you as this is the greatest decision you can make with your one and only life. And we would love to pray with you during this next week and we'd love to send you some material to help you in this journey. And so I'm gonna pray with you right now as you make this decision. Lord Jesus, thank you that you are who you say you are, that you are Lord, that you died and then three days later you rose from the grave defeating sin and death. I align myself with what you say about who you are. Forgive me of my sins. Forgive me of every time I have distanced myself from your word. I also believe what your word says about who I am. That I am right now as I accept you as my Lord, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Thank you that this is the beginning of the greatest journey of my life. Again, Lord, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. I lay down my life and I live for you. 